Hi everybody, I'm Brian Mudd, a fan of South Plains politics. Here's your talking points for this week. Groups are already forming to let the Lubbock City Council know they're all for keeping abortions out of our city, but will the potential for legal liability be too much for city leaders to act? I'm Anna Warnicke in Washington. A recent report shows what the oil industry could look like after the November election. I'll have that story coming up. From the studios of KMAC Television in Lubbock, your local election headquarters, this is Talking Points with Brian Mudd. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Also this week, rules? What rules? I think most people understand that when you have a large-scale emergency like a hurricane or a pandemic, the people in charge need to have the authority to act quickly to save lives and property. And Governor Greg Abbott has been given that leeway for several months, which has frankly left local officials to take the heat from the political fallout and state lawmakers to clean up the economic fallout in January. And if you haven't noticed lately, a lot of those folks are getting kind of tired of being left out of the decision-making process, leading to the governor this week essentially being sued by members of his own political party. Our Alex Capriello explains what's going on here. I didn't take a note to a party. I didn't take a note to a person. I took a note to the rule of law, and that means doing what is right. Alan West, the chairman of the Texas Republican Party, is one of several prominent GOP members to file the lawsuit against Governor Abbott. This is nothing against the governor or anyone. This is about following Texas election law and making sure that the people are protected. He says the issue isn't that voters get to cast their ballots early. It's that the governor is breaking the law by issuing a change through executive order instead of calling for a special session. As a challenge to emergency power generally, I mean, good luck. I mean, governors just have to have that kind of power. David Cole, an attorney who studies constitutional law, says it's a big ask this close to the election. He says it's possible that an injunction can be issued by the Texas Supreme Court, but it's more likely to be denied or at least halted until more information can come in. The governor made this proclamation in late July, and here it is, late September, uh, the court could easily say, where have you been for the last two months? Travis County Clerk Dana Debevoir says disruptions like this have potential to create errors in the counting process. At this point, it is really too late to change anything without running the risk that you're going to you know, expose yourself to some kind of innocent error. And that dumb voters don't like that at all. Despite the legal battle, her message to voters is clear. Disregard the noise. Just make a plan to go vote. All right, Alex Capriello reporting for us. Lubbock Senator Charles Perry is one of the GOP leaders on that lawsuit. I, I guess I ought to ask first. Senator Campbell said she didn't uh, agree to be in part of the suit beforehand and to take her name off of it. Did, did you know b about this before it was filed? Sure, okay. sure. It had been multiple conversations around the places that uh, this is what they were looking at. There was a question whether it was going to get filed or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. And, and, and I know you've said this really has nothing necessarily to do with early voting per se, right? Correct. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of convenience, and early mm -hmm. voting provides a huge convenience. Some communities don't do that. You know, people, I think, expect that is the law. It's just kind of up to the local elected officials or the county, county officials. But uh, effectively, my, my whole problem with this issue is we make those laws. Early voting is, is d determined by the legislative law that we draw. Mm -hmm. uh, we accommodate voters to the best of our ability. We currently give them two weeks. We currently uh, extend opportunities for absentee ballots. We extend disabled ballots, elderly ballots. All of those are legislative matters. And it just concerns me, as this whole COVID experience has, has revealed, as a legislature, we have very little input along the process when a disaster extends beyond what I think anybody that drew up the Constitution or anybody that drew up those statutes under the disaster declarations could ever imagine that we were be talking about a disaster, mainly from an economic perspective as well as some of the life loss perspective, seven, eight months and then going into an in, uh, today, I think, in perpetuity. We don't know what the end game looks like. Right. So my whole concern was those are things that the legislator are better equipped to do and constitutionally obligated to do not not disaster declarations and, and you don't have any other recourse unless the legislature's in session right it, it, we're not in session and yeah. the only way to go back into session is a governor call right so we're not going to get called back to have these conversations As, unfortunately the only other recourse we have outside of informal communications is our interim hearings that can't be had 
is an actual uh, judiciary route. Do you see how, though, I guess with the pandemic fears and, and, and the election time back and forth, how some people are now going to think, well, here are Republicans trying to limit voting access for people. Yeah, I, I can't change perception. Yeah. Here's what I've got to do. I won't always be in the legislature. People will come and go after me and before me. And if there's not a standard that's not going to be changed, no matter what the circumstances is that we can't adhere to, with some flexibility, the, the early stages of a disaster, there's a lot of latitude granted mm -hmm. to the governor. But we have to hang on to the fundamental cores that we all are going to be held accountable to in our legislative matters. Constitutionally, this is not something that a disaster declaration should be involved in. Let's talk quickly about the latest on the drafted ordinance uh, to have the city council designate Lubbock as a sanctuary city for the unborn. Any new information or, or, or So with that? the council's sent it for legal opinion. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for them to get back with the legal opinion. What they do with that legal opinion will be in their court, and it is currently in their court. We are currently uh, pursuing the uh, number of signatures, rough, roughly 3,621, I believe it is, mm -hmm. to have that ordinance put on the agenda, assuming that the council chooses not to after they render that opinion or review that opinion. Uh, was getting the outside legal liability uh, opinion necessary for this? Are, are they doing due, due, due diligence with so this? Or I, what? I'm not going to try to micromanage their process. They felt needed to do it. I had handed them or gave them a pro bono attorney mm -hmm. that has defended this ordinance around the state. Uh, and he was more than willing to have that conversation and, 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 and let them ask their questions. But they felt like they needed to go out, and they went out to a Houston firm that uh, that they wanted an opinion from. And, and I've heard about the chance of outside legal defense funds even being set up as, as well on this. But it, I, I don't know, I guess the question is, is it smart maybe to, to count on that as potentially being a sure thing when you know that you could at least have to use tax money to defend all this? So, as I stated, Jonathan Mitchell, the attorney that's defended this around the state, has committed pro bono and would draw up an engagement letter as such to defend the city if they were challenged once this ordinance passed. So no cost there. Internally, arguably, you would have some response and some attorney's time tied up. We have a large attorney staff at the city. Mm -hmm. So they, it's not, I don't think, an insurmountable amount of money that we're talking about. But we had an option or have an option if the city uh, passes the ordinance or if by petition it gets passed to defend it at no cost to the taxpayers. Have you heard from a lot of folks who are willing to jump on with the signatures and also we've, we've seen people out, you know, out front of council meetings with a little uh, protest? It's been a long time since I've seen a community, a specifically a community of faith, unite around a pretty much a, a common cause and it's been encouraging and overwhelming. I thought that would be the case, but you never know. But uh, those numbers uh, are uh, growing by the day, I think is a fair statement to say, uh, and we'll pursue it to the end. And once the process is done, we'll either have an ordinance or we won't. And uh, I hope I hope that we do. You know, along those lines, it looks as if the president is at least going to get another nomination of a conservative uh, Supreme Court justice here. We'll see if it gets to the confirmation quickly, but if it does go through, does this open the door for another shot at, say, the heartbeat bill in the next legislative yeah, session. I, I think it opens the, short, the door for state rights. Yeah. I think the court has sent enough telegraph, enough messaging, even in the dissenting opinions back in 73, that this is more a legislative matter and probably more appropriate in the states. So I think the best case would be that we don't have a Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. um, I think that We've, we're paying for some of those decisions. That's a different discussion. But mm -hmm. uh, I think probably best case scenario politically is is that's handed back to the states as a state rights matter. And I'm I'm very much in agreement making it a states rights issue if we can't get rid of it at a national level. Lubbock State Senator Charles Perry, I know you're very busy. We sure appreciate you swinging in here for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. See you.